Welcome to episode 68 of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. I'm a retired agent writing crime fiction inspired by true crime FBI cases. In this episode, we get to speak to retired agent Phil Sinna, who served 25 years in federal law enforcement, seven as a deputy U.S. Marshal, and 18 as a special agent with the FBI. Phil is interviewed about the fugitive investigation of a cop killer. Top 10 fugitive Ted Otzuki. In October 1987, Otzuki killed Boston police officer Roy Sergi and wounded officer George Torres when they responded to a domestic disturbance call. A national manhunt to locate and capture Otzuki ensued. After Phil developed a crucial cooperating witness, working closely with Boston and San Francisco detectives, he took up the fugitive hunt in San Francisco, Texas, and Guadalajara, Mexico. It was in Mexico that Otzuki was eventually captured by Mexican Federal Judicial Police and the FBI. In addition to working fugitive cases during his bureau career, Phil Sinna gained extensive experience in the investigation of violent crime and terrorism and served as a supervisory special agent of the bank robbery kidnap squad, the fugitive task force, and the violent gang task force, as well as crisis management coordinator and SWAT team coordinator in the FBI Tactical Operations Center for the San Francisco Division. He was also supervisor of and a diver on the FBI Western Region Underwater Search and Recovery Team. Phil Senna is certified as a police instructor, firearms instructor, defensive tactics instructor, SWAT instructor, police fitness instructor, and tactical instructor. I really enjoyed speaking with Phil. Phil and I attended the FBI Academy together way back in 1982, and I remember him well. I was a 25-year-old former probation officer, and Phil was one of the many classmates of mine who were already experienced law enforcement officers. During my time at the Academy, not only did I learn from the instructors, but I also learned from watching Phil, and how he handled situations at the FBI Academy. It was great catching up with him. I was pleasantly surprised at the job he took on after he retired from the FBI. You'll have to stay tuned to hear more about that. I want to dedicate this episode to the family of police officer Roy Sergi and to all law enforcement officers killed in the line of duty. Phil and I experienced the horror of having someone we know shot down. Our classmate, Jerry Dove, was killed in the line of duty on April 11th, 1986, in the Miami shootout. I attended Jerry Dove's funeral and too many others since. Last week was Law Enforcement Appreciation Week, but with this episode, let's honor all fallen law enforcement officers this week and every week. If you're listening to this episode, the week that it comes out, I want to remind you that the new FBI series inside the FBI by the producer of the Law and Order franchise will be airing their two episode finale next Thursday, June 1st at 10 o'clock Eastern time. In my last newsletter, I indicated that I wasn't sure about the show. I thought the first episode was a little over the top. You know, they tried a little bit too hard to make what is already a fascinating job more sensational. But the subsequent episodes have been absolutely fantastic. There's one part of that show that really had me missing my time with the FBI. I'll tell you all about it in the June newsletter. 
My FBI Retired Case File Review newsletter is all about the FBI in books, TV, and movies. I put it out once a month. If you're interested in signing up for my newsletter, all you need to do is go to jerrywilliams.com and sign up when you see the pop-up. In the June issue, I'll also give you information about the new feature film about the Unabomber that was recently announced. And the last thing I want to mention, of course, is my FBI crime thriller, Pay to Play. It's still doing well on Amazon.com. And I just want to remind you that when you pick up a copy of Pay to Play for yourself or as a gift for someone you know loves crime fiction, you're supporting the show and me by helping to defray the cost for me to continue to produce ad-free content on a weekly basis. Plus, as you can tell from the great reviews, Pay to Play is a great read. So keep the reviews as well as the tweets, posts, and emails coming. Thank you. Here's the show. I am excited to introduce our guest, Phil Sinna. Hi, Phil. How you doing, Jerry? I'm doing great. Um, I have already told everyone that we attended the FBI Academy together so many years ago. And uh, this is the first time uh, we've really chatted since then. So I am really excited to to hear what you've been doing. Well, what we're going to talk about is uh, a top 10 fugitive case out of Boston, Ted Jeffrey Otsuki, who shot two Boston police officers and subsequently one of those officers expired, became a, uh, a high priority case in Boston, and the linkages here to San Francisco put me involved in the case as a result of my work as a uh, a bomb scene investigator. The Boston folks had come up with some information uh, tying the shooter to San Francisco, which in turn created some links to a fellow in Minneapolis. There in Minneapolis, one of the FBI agents interviewed that particular ex-con who gave them some information about a storage unit in San Francisco. San Francisco Police Asian Gang Task Force, uh, Inspector Sergeant Dan Foley to be specific, got a search warrant for that storage unit. The expectation was that they would find uh, instrumentality of the uh, criminal activity in Boston in that storage unit. And what they discovered in that storage unit were a couple of uh, remote control bombs, uh, devices that were built by the Boston shooter, Ozuki, and placed into this storage unit with the intention of using them to kidnap a uh, bank president or bank officer, handcuff the, uh, the bomb briefcase to his wrist, and then convince him to uh, give Ozuki access to the bank. Wow. All in that storage shed. Why don't you take us to the very beginning? Take us to to Boston. Uh, I know you were in San Francisco, but could you tell us a little bit more about these police officers okay. that were, were shot and, and how that all happened? Well, what happened in Boston was we had uh, in the back bay – section of Boston. We had an apartment building. Uh, There was a domestic dispute in the apartment building. And when the uh, responding officers got to the apartment building, they rang the doorbell of the complainant and got no response. So like uh, officers do most places, they push the buttons for every other unit trying to get entry through the uh, electronically controlled front door. And one of the buttons they pushed was uh, for Ted Ozuki's apartment. Ted looked out the window, uh, we suppose, and saw the police officers, suspected they were coming for him because he was there doing criminal activity. And because he was there and armed, he was also a parole violator. He jumped out the back window. When he jumped out the back window, He ended up in a fenced-in area, and two police officers were at the front door, 
two police officers came around the back side of the building. The uh, the officers on the back side of the building spotted Ozuki and told him to come on over the fence. Uh, he did. He climbed up on over the fence, and they put him up against the fence and went to pat him down. And at that point, uh, he opened fire with a 9 millimeter handgun that he had in a, a shoulder holster. He chased those two officers down the alley, firing at them, and hit one of them uh, uh, during the course of that shooting. And that was uh, Jorge Torres, uh, who was shot during that confrontation. The two police officers in the front, hearing the gunshots, came running around the building. Uh, by this time, Ozuki had also come around the side of the building and was standing in a doorway, a recessed doorway. So as the officers in the front ran around the block and ran by Ozuki, he popped up and opened fire on him. And that's when he shot Roy Sergi. Uh, Roy Sergi uh, expired several weeks later in the hospital. The manhunt was on. They had a pretty good description uh, of the shooter, and uh, the uh, Boston Police Department assigned three experienced homicide detectives to the case, Jack Carroll, uh, Jimmy Fong, and Jimmy Powers, the two Jimmys. FBI Boston was brought in on it with the expectation that this guy had fled, fled the Boston area. So uh, Boston opened up a uh, unlawful flight on an unsub, actually, and began working on it along with Boston PD. So we had uh, Jay Fallon from uh, Boston FBI, Jimmy Powers, Jimmy Fong, and Jack Carroll doing everything they can to figure out who this fellow is. Uh, the investigations there uh, turned up some links to San Francisco and uh, uh, under an alias and Utilizing that alias, since he was Asian, they went directly to the Asian Gang Task Force in San Francisco PD. These guys had been around for quite some time, and they had a pretty good uh, handle on the community in San Francisco, the gangster community. So uh, they were running. What Everybody was running hard with this. Uh, we had a police officer in critical condition, another one in serious condition, and uh, a shooter on the loose. So... Uh, the Boston folks really wanted to get a handle on this. Uh, unfortunately, when Roy Sergi died, the whole scenario changed. Now, uh, we got a cop killer. Well, we do. And Boston FBI was in a position where they, they really wanted this to become a top 10 case, but they needed to enhance the criminal activity of Ozuki in order to, to meet that threshold. And once, uh, we discovered the bombs out here and were able to pin that to Ozuki. Now we had the nexus. Uh, once we filed the bomb cases here in San Francisco, headquarters decided it was a, a enough of a criminal activity on the part of Ozuki to warrant uh, he being included on the top ten kit, uh, list. Well, let me stop you there for just a second because I think this is a good time to tell everyone about your background because this is right in your area of expertise because before you became an FBI agent, you were a deputy U.S. marshal, so you know all about fugitives. So could you just uh, real briefly just tell us a little bit more about when you joined the FBI and why you joined the FBI, and then we'll get right back into uh, your part of the top ten fugitive case. Uh, I joined the FBI in 1982, and uh uh, why I joined the FBI. Uh, when I was a little boy, I wanted to be an FBI agent, a U.S. Marshal, and a Texas Ranger. I've gotten two out of three. I don't think I'll ever be a Texas Ranger. To be honest with you, I was uh, very happy where I was as a deputy U.S. Marshal in Santa Fe, New Mexico. I was the only deputy in Santa Fe. But as luck would have it in a political move, the uh, the Marshal Service was involved in a rip, and I was the junior deputy in the District of New Mexico. So I got a rift notice, and uh, the guys in the RA in Santa Fe said, oh, gee, why don't you come to the FBI? And was like, well, I don't know. I, I like you guys, but I don't particularly like the FBI, you know. <laughs> <laughs> 
And uh, you know, they they sent the recruiter up, and uh, Bill Towerzone was his name, and and Bill and I talked, and I really liked Bill. So uh, the FBI was one of several agencies that I applied to uh, as a result of the RIF, and as luck would have it, the FBI hired me first, and I good, don't regret good it for us. Yeah, yeah I don't us. regret it. I, it was the best move I ever made. But uh, at the time, I was very hesitant. Uh, I come from a family of cops, and they didn't mind me being. Uh, a deputy U.S. marshal, but they really had a hard time with me joining the FBI. <laughs> As and we all know, there's myths out there about the FBI absolutely. and law enforcement. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I I'm still ho- have a hopeful. cousin that holds me at arm's length. <laughs> well, hopefully a lot of that is changing, especially with uh, you know, task forces and us working together very closely with other law enforcement partners. I'm, I'm hoping that that's changing in real life, and we'll still have to work on what's happening in books and TV and movies. But, yeah, for uh, sure. I found it in the task forces that I worked on and that I managed that we we definitely uh, found common ground and worked well together. So uh, I think that's the wave of the future. All right. So for this, this particular case, um, this top 10 Osuki case, uh, was that part of a fugitive task force? No, it okay. wasn't. Uh, it, and actually, uh, as you mentioned, my, my background doing fugitive work, not only in uh, in the U.S. Marshals, but also in the Bureau, uh, both in Minneapolis Division, and I was on the fugitive squad in San Francisco before going over to the uh, counterterrorism bomb squad, put me in a, uh, a comfortable position to deal with this since the agent that was assigned the 88, the, the fugitive case, simply couldn't work on it. Uh, he was up to his ears in a, in a major political uh, explosion uh, at the Presidio Army Base having to do with um, a pedophile ring. Oh. And it was a front page every day, and he simply couldn't devote any time to the 88, to the fugitive case. So it was decided that I would handle the, not only the bomb cases, but the fugitive leads. And, and that's how I ended up so heavily immersed in this. Uh, the information that led to Brownsville, Texas, and to the uh, identification of Ozuki as the shooter also ultimately led to a uh, an associate of Ozuki's in San Francisco. And uh, we went and we talked with this associate, myself and uh, Dan Foley, uh, Sergeant Foley, and Clyde Foreman, who was the original fugitive case manager. So we talked with this fellow one day. Uh, his name was Jim Burkhart. And it was pretty obvious that, that Jim was extremely reluctant to speak with us. His entire adult life was spent. Uh, in custody, and uh, he and Ozuki became friends, serving time together in Leavenworth. So he was not particularly receptive to any law enforcement overtures. But uh, Dan and I felt that that there was something there, and we just kept at him. We slowly started to uh, to get him interested in changing his life. We interviewed him. Every day for a two-week period, some days went as long as 18 hours, trying to craft a situation where he would feel comfortable enough to enter into an immunity agreement where we would absolve him of his criminal past if he would uh, give us what we needed on Ozuki. Initially, we were looking just simply for information to find Ozuki. But as it turned out, uh, as we move forward with this uh, crafting this immunity agreement with the U.S. Attorney's Office, trying to convince this fellow that first he had to tell us what to give him immunity for, (laughs) and he also had to proffer how he could help us, what information he had that could bring closure to this investigation. Was he in custody for something else when you were doing? Not yet. (laughs) Okay. So he was was talking to you. He was on the street. So he was talking to you every day while he was on the street. He could have told exactly. you guys to go pound sand. He could have, but you have to remember this guy had been incarcerated for so long, and he also knew something that we didn't know, uh, what criminal activity he'd been involved in with Ted. And Did he think you knew? He probably thought we had 
an inkling, but we didn't have any sp- specifics. And he was trying to figure out if he could wipe the slate clean. So it was a dance, if you will. We were dancing around each other. The guys in Boston thought that Dan Foley and I were moving too slowly. So in an effort to help things move along a little faster, they had our witness arrested. (laughs) They violated him on a parole violation warrant and rolled him up. And uh, I didn't particularly appreciate that. Uh, There was no communication beforehand. As the British would say, Dan and I were gobsmacked. We had no idea this was coming. And now we had to rebuild our relationship with uh, Mr. Burkhart and uh, kind of start over again, which, which we did. Who did the arrest? He was in San Francisco area. Who conducted right. the uh Oh, the U.S. Marshals the did. The Marshals got a warrant in Boston, and the Marshals in San Francisco rolled him up uh, and created a kind of a log jam for us here, but you know, we worked around it. It created a, a lot of angst. Uh, as you can imagine, being a former deputy, uh, I was not well received by the deputy U.S. marshals locally, although I had a couple of friends in that office in San Francisco. But, you know, it's a small organization, and I was a traitor. So now I had to go to them every day with my hat in my hand and ask them to bring Jim Burkhart from Santa Rita lockup out in the East Bay back to San Francisco so we could continue to interview him. They refused to do so. So now it's to the U.S. Attorney's Office. Uh, get a writ, get the writ to a judge, get the judge to sign it, and force them to produce Jim Burkhart every day. So now you, I'm, I'm definitely persona non grata with yeah. the U.S. Marshals in San Francisco. Eventually we craft an agreement, uh, and I had them move Burkhart from the Santa Rita facility to Oakland City Jail, which they had a contract with. So he was housed in Oakland City Jail, so at least Dan and I could get to him easily. Uh, all we had to do was cross the, the bay to get to him. So we'd go there every day and sit down and work with him. And, and we finally crafted the immunity agreement. Uh, got it signed off on by the U.S. Attorney and by Maine Justice, and uh, he, he started to open up for us. In the immunity agreement, what we wanted was, uh, first of all, he had to come clean on all of his criminal activity. Uh, if he had anything to do with the homicide in Boston with the murder of Roy Sergi, the immunity agreement was null and void. We needed him to, to make consensually monitored phone calls for us to try to pin down Azuki. We needed him to get up on computer bulletin boards, which was the way that they communicated. And we needed for him to travel to Brownsville, Texas, in an effort to locate Azuki. So all of this was part of the immunity agreement, and uh, we went through with the whole thing, and it worked out. Then... Uh, Mr. Burkhart, I'll just call him Jim. Jim uh, gave us information about uh, weapons that he had acquired from Azuki. There was an automobile that Azuki used as a getaway car from Boston. He drove that getaway car to Ohio and to Dayton and parked the car in the long-term parking at Dayton Airport, and then he flew to Texas. He left uh, the car locked there with his weapons in the car. He contacted our informant, who is now a cooperating witness, if you will, Jim Burkhart, and told Jim to go to Dayton and get the car. So he he, uh, FedExed the car keys and the parking ticket to Jim Burkhart in San Francisco, who then got got himself to Dayton, took uh, took a bus to Dayton, and picked up the getaway car. You've been doing this dance with him and trying to interview him, you know, for a a long period of time. You just knew that he knew Osuki, but was this a surprise to you? Uh, We had information. uh, Agent Mike Gorgon in Minneapolis had interviewed uh, another associate by the name of Streeter. And Streeter was the one that gave the information about the storage unit. But Streeter also filled in Gorgon on the uh, the relationship between Ozuki, Streeter, a fellow named Juiced who was in Boston, and our Jim Burkhart. That those four guys had been thick as thieves 
in Leavenworth, and they had taken computer classes together in Leavenworth, and they had formed a bond, if you will. Streeter's take on all of this was that they were planning criminal activity, and that's why Ozuki was in Boston. We were never able to verify that Ozuki met with the with the fellow named Juiced in Boston, but that was the the expectation. So now we knew that Burkhart was intimately involved in planning and and most likely carrying out criminal activity with Ozuki. To what extent we didn't know. So it was just a matter of trying to fish this information uh, out of Burkhart. I can't tell you how many bottles of aspirin Dan Foley and I went through. This guy used to just give us headaches because we'd talk around in circles for hours. And he was so completely reluctant to trust us. Dan was a a long-experienced cop, and I had had a lot of experience with cons working as a deputy. And then to augment our own innate knowledge and abilities, uh, I was fortunate enough to be on the same squad with uh, Mary Ellen O'Toole who was one of the best profilers I ever met. And uh, we talked with Mary Ellen and gave her the whole rundown on what we were doing and how we were doing it and got as much advice and insight as we could from her about uh, ways to approach and ways to uh, disarm uh, his defenses. And her input was extremely helpful. So, you know, we moved on from there, uh, had some success with him. He copped to uh, actually aiding in the construction of those bombs. And he also copped to an unsolved bank robbery here in San Mateo County that he'd done with uh, Ted Ozuki. And uh, the car that he picked up contained not only an arsenal of long guns, which he then turned over to us that he had stashed here in San Francisco, uh, an AK-47 and an HK-91. But then he drops on us that the murder weapon was also in the car. Wow. And what did you do to the murder weapon? He said, well, I was told to destroy it. And I, well, did you? Well, no, I couldn't. What did you do with it? Well, you know, I don't want I don't want this guy to get in trouble. Look, what did you do with it? Finally, we get him to to tell us what he did with the murder weapon, and he had driven to uh, the Ozarks where his his family lived, and he had taken the murder weapon, which was a uh, high quality pistol. Is that why he said he couldn't destroy it because it was it high was, quality? It was too good a weapon to throw away. <laughs> so he took it. And he gave it to his father, who lived in a rural area of the Ozarks. I got on the phone and called his father. And I explained to him what was going on and told him that his son was doing the right thing. And he was helping us. He was turning his life around. Could he tell me what happened to the pistol? And he said he still had it. And I said, have you done anything to it? And he says, well, I only shot it once. He says, I shot it at a raccoon that was on my roof. I said, have you done anything else to it? Have you cleaned it? Have you oiled it? He goes, nope, it's just the way I got it. I said, we're going to send somebody there to to come and pick up that weapon. <laughs> so we sent an agent from uh, Missouri and a, 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 who was uh, taken into the area by a, a Missouri state trooper. And they recovered the murder weapon. Wow. Uh, the murder weapon, obviously, is the weapon that was used to kill Roy Sergi, uh, but it's also, in the in the magazine, the lab was able to lift a, a good fingerprint of Ozuki from one of the shells in the magazine. So now we have the murder weapon. We have it tied to Ozuki from a witness, a cooperating witness, who's going to be impeached like crazy. But we have Ozuki's fingerprint on one of the bullets, and that's good. So we're moving ahead here. Now we've got to try to figure out where Ozuki is. We're tying together a case, but now we need the shooter. Can you give me a time frame? Where are we as far as when the actual shootings in Boston occurred? How how long have you been working on this? Oh, now? boy. The shootings in Boston, if I remember correctly, uh, occurred in November. I'd have to look. Uh, you know, I don't have that date off the top of my head. I think it was November. We're into uh, probably March at this point. Okay, the shooting took place October 2nd, 
I know that once something becomes, you know, a top 10 fugitive case, then the pressure is on. You know, people want to be able to solve those type of cases quickly. That's why there is a top 10 program. Right. So, right. So, um, yeah, there's no question about that. But from my perspective, while I, I wanted to get the, um, the fugitive, there's no question about that. We also knew that that we had a treasure trove here, and we were we were going to be able to put together things that would be absolutely important for the prosecution because we want to convict this guy, and you know we want him to go away forever. You know, once we had the murder weapon and we we're able to tie that to Ozuki, and now we had some you know, critical things that were going on here. We had to figure out how to uh, maximize the credibility of this guy Burkhart, who, for all intents and purposes, should have spent his entire life in prison. <laughs> you know, but we gave him a walk, and that doesn't add to his credibility. So, uh, you know, you don't know what the uh, what the defense is going to throw at you in, in an effort to impeach the one good witness that you have. So you know, we had to be really, really careful about what we were doing did you have plans what you could do to to rehabilitate your uh, witness, you know, to make him more palatable? There was very little you could do to rehabilitate this guy. He, he literally had spent his entire adult life in and out of prison. Mm. I don't think he'd ever held a job that wasn't questionable, to be honest with you. Um, and he so you have just... a witness that is not, in, in the eyes of, of most people, would be deemed untrustworthy. Absolutely. All right, Absolutely. Yeah. So you, you got so it. You know, yeah. So the the fingerprint on the shell casing in the murder weapon was critical. And if Jim Burkhart never gave us anything else, just us having that uh, was huge because now we had this link to Ozuki that certainly the defense is going to go after it. But it's it's the kind of hard evidence that that juries like. Uh, you know, you can craft any kind of excuse you want for his fingerprint being on that on that shell casing, uh, and uh, ultimately the uh, the defense did try to indicate that it wasn't Ozuki, and it was kind of a crazy uh, scenario they came up with that that it was actually Burkhart <laughs> that. Uh, had done all these criminal acts and that Burkhardt had driven across the country and that Burkhardt had done this and initially on the way to Boston. And the uh, the car that we recovered that had been uh, Ozuki's car, uh, you know, while we were inspecting it and, and looking it over, uh, Dan and I spotted a uh, an oil change sticker. And it was for an oil changer somewhere in the Midwest like St. Louis. I was like, really? And we looked at the dates of the oil change, and the oil change was done on the trip from San Francisco to Boston that Ozuki had made. He had stopped. He was such an anal guy. He had stopped and had his oil change. <laughs> so we contacted the oil changer, and the guy who wrote the, the work order remembered this Japanese guy because they didn't have very many Japanese customers. So we were able, you know, through the oil changer sticker, to at least place Ozuki at the wheel on the trip out to Boston while the defense was maintaining that it was actually Jim Burkhart that drove the car to Boston and did all the bad things in Boston. I was like, really? Okay. So then you know, we shot some holes in, into their theory there, and ultimately the the jury didn't buy any of this. The activities of Ozuki were enough to uh, to gain the conviction, and once we had the uh, the murder weapon with his fingerprint on it, and that that turned out to be the pivotal piece of of information. That murder weapon was linked irrefutably to Ozuki. So while you're Dealing with uh, Jim Burkhart, and you're finding this information, how much of it are you sharing with him? Does he know that you found this fingerprint? Does he know that you've been able to verify 
uh, Ozuki's trip to Boston because of the oil change. How much of that do you tell your cooperating informant, and how much of that do you keep to yourself? Because you're still trying to convince them to, to do more and to give you more and to continue to work with you. Uh, he was privy to some of that, not all of it, and we, we weren't really concerned about his cooperation because the immunity agreement stated the terms of his cooperation, things that he still had to do. And if he failed to do any of them, the entire agreement was null and void. So he had to make consensually monitored calls. He had to go to Brownsville with us. Uh, you know, there were some, you know, really wild uh, potential uh, operations that were crafted in the imaginations of some of the investigators involved with the case. But ultimately, we had Jim Burkhart, and Dan Foley and I had convinced Jim Burkhart that we were going to run Burkhart into the father, to Ozuki's father. Ozuki's father was the link. Un unlike what the FBI store or FBI files said about, you know, some re relatives. It wasn't relatives. It was, it was uh, Ozuki's father. Uh, who was a well-respected farmer in the Brownsville area, uh, a, a man of, of substance in the community. But he was also providing uh, linkage between his criminal son and the criminal co-conspirators. We were aware of that from Burkhart. Burkhart felt confident that he could get the old man to provide some sort of uh, a communication with Ozuki. Now, Ozuki and Burkhardt had had many conversations about you know, things that, that they would do in the future. Obviously, they were in, involved in criminal acts together. Ozuki had told Burkhardt in the past that he would go to Mexico. And it, if you need to get in touch with me, you, know, you can get in touch with me through my dad. So this uh, method of communication was already primed. Now I have a problem. I have a, a cooperating witness with a use of immunity agreement who will travel with me to Brownsville, Texas. Unfortunately, he's locked up. <laughs> That's so, right. <laughs> uh, I, I can't unlock him. Uh, you know, the, the Marshal Service can't decide to you know, undo any of this. So now we have to figure out how we're going to do this. So I, eventually I have to go to the uh, U.S. Parole Commission. And the parole commissioner for uh, Northern California was uh, a woman by the name of uh, Sandra Brown Armstrong. She is now a, a federal judge, but she was the U.S. parole commissioner. A nice lady. Uh, I had to convince her that, uh, A, I was going to protect him. B, I wasn't going to let him associate with any criminals. And C, that we weren't going to involve him or us in criminal activity. We were able to convince her of that, and she signed off uh, on an order releasing Jim Burkhardt to my custody and allowing me to take him to Texas. So now we have to craft this operation. We're going to go to Texas. We're going to take Burkhardt there, and we're going to run him into the dad. So uh, you know, we provided uh, all the resources from San Francisco Division to accomplish that. And then uh, a fellow named Tom Bush, uh, who was at headquarters in the fugitive unit, provided the, uh, the national resources. Uh, we went down there with three SOG teams, two fixed-wing aircraft, uh, a dozen agents from San Francisco, uh, tech, uh, radio techs, transmitters, repeaters, and we set up a command post on South Padre Island. I do want to just say for everyone that SOG is uh, the surveillance team. Right. We had three of those uh, from various divisions. A dozen agents from San Francisco because we needed a babysitter for Jim Burkhart, and we also needed you know, miscellaneous activities at, uh, at a command post. Plus, we had the... Uh, the inspectors, uh, the detectives from Boston PD, and the agent from Boston, uh, Jay Fallon. This is what having somebody designated as a top 10 fugitive will get you, resources and manpower. <laughs> <laughs>
Yes, ma'am. Uh, not only that, uh, cooperation of the local division uh, was critical, and they were very, very good. A guy named Bob Nixon down at Brownsville RA, you know, moved heaven and earth for us, providing us resources. Uh, the meetings in Mexico with the police officials in Mexico. We had traveled down there uh, to Brownsville to set this whole thing up prior to, to moving the entire operation down there. So we identified where we were going to do things, how we were going to do things, what the impediments would be, how we could overcome uh, those problems, uh, and just things that we needed to, to accomplish. And we also needed to be able to put all these people somewhere where they wouldn't raise suspicion. So we, we went to South Padre Island because it's very close to Brownsville, but it's a tourist mecca. So bringing in a bunch of folks that didn't belong wouldn't be noticed because nobody belongs on South Padre Island. They're all from somewhere else. So we set up our command post there in a high rise that overlooked the ocean. It was tough duty. Uh, but we needed to get some, some height for the repeaters because we were going to be operating in Mexico. We had uh, the ability to take our aircraft and our special operations groups into Mexico. Uh, Mexican authorities were very cooperative. The uh, LEGAT in Mexico, Steve Walker, handled all of that liaison. Uh, we had several meetings down there uh, with Steve and the Mexican authorities, and everything was put into place because it was, uh, without doubt, that's where he was going to be. And now we needed to figure out how to get, figure out where in Mexico he was and then pinpoint that. We, uh, we moved the whole operation down to Texas, and uh, the goal was for uh, Jim Burkhart uh, to wear a transmitter and also to wear a recorder. It was, it was very warm, uh, humid in, in that uh, Solgen and in, in that uh, Harlingen Valley area, uh, wet ag area. Burkhart was very uncomfortable. We were all in shirt sleeves. He was very uncomfortable when I put the Nagra on him. And uh, So I just made the call that we were going to do this without the Nagra, and we, we put a pager transmitter on him, and he felt better about that. And then it was just a matter of, uh, you know, we had to stay on this guy. I'd have egg on my face if, if he got away, <laughs> so it wouldn't be good. I didn't want to have to explain this to the parole commissioner. So we were on him, and we ran him into the dad. As you're listening, so so he doesn't have the Niagara, so it's not actually being recorded. Well, but, we're recording well, off the transmitter. Okay, that's what I was going to ask you. Yeah. Were, you re, were you recording, or were you mm -hmm. taking notes? No, we were recording off the transmitter, but it wasn't great. Uh, okay. Niagara's a wonderful... Uh, Pager transmitters are, are marginal, but our tech guys did the best they could and did a great job. So uh, the meeting between Burkhart and uh, Ted Ozuki's father uh, went well. Uh, Burkhart spun a tale about needing to get in touch with, uh, with Ted concerning uh, weapons and, and uh, fruits of the crime that needed to be handled, and he needed some, some guidance from Ted and uh, Dad said that, uh, well, you know, he, he uh, couldn't do anything right now, but uh, tomorrow we're going to go across the border, you and I, and uh, I'll communicate with Ted. So now we're scrambling. I have a decision to make here. This guy is in my custody. I do not have authority to take him into Mexico. Mm. So it's like, this is my job. I got a wife, but I don't have any kids yet, so I have a pet rock. Not a problem. Okay, so we're going into Mexico. So we briefed up the teams. Uh, Mexican authorities say we cannot be armed. Uh, to my knowledge, uh, I, I can't say that anybody was armed, but I suspect that they were when they went into Mexico because they were probably more in danger from the Matamoros police than they were from any fugitive. So we sent our teams in covering the movement Ozuki, father, and uh, our informant, uh, Jim Burkhart. They went in and they, they sat at a restaurant. They had something to eat. And then they went to a public telephone entity where Mexicans go in. And the number that they're seeking to call is dialed by an operator. And then they, in turn, can speak on the telephone. And you pay at the booth. The, the dad went in and performed that function and called a number, and Ted Ozuki, the fugitive, came on the line. The 
father spoke with him and gave the phone to our informant, who then spoke with him and asked the questions that he needed asked and uh, got the information that he needed and, and kept the uh, the scenario going. Uh, everything went fine. When the conversation was done, the, the father and our informant drove back into Texas. Uh, we recovered the informant. Uh, meanwhile, the uh, Mexican Federal Judicial Police, MFJP, went to the telephone exchange and got the, the telephone number that was called. It was in Guadalajara. Uh, they immediately had their assets in Guadalajara go to the location of that telephone number uh, Oziki was not there, so they set up on the location in Guadalajara. What was the location? It was a uh, multi-unit uh, apartment building uh, in Guadalajara, and uh, Ozuki was a tenant. Just that when they got there, he just happened to be out of pocket. Uh, after several hours, he returned. Uh, the Mexican Federal Judicial Police Affected their arrest during the course of the arrest. Uh, Ted Ozuki attempted to uh, to fire upon them with a Colt 45 semi-automatic handgun that he had tucked in his waistband. The uh, the officers affected their arrest and notified us that they had him in custody and notified Steve Walker. Uh, the legat who was involved in this case. And uh, then it was just a matter of us having to have some patience because the announcement was not going to be made until the, the commandant was available to make the uh, official announcement. So we couldn't make any announcement in the United States until after uh, the Mexican authorities made their announcement. So that took about 36 hours. And it was all said and done. The uh, uh, Mexican authorities made their announcement. Uh, FBI in Boston, Boston PD in a joint scenario made their announcement. Jim Ahern was the SAC at that time in Boston. Everybody got their, their microphone and FaceTime. And uh, they were pretty pleased. And now the, uh, the after action began. Now we had to clean all this up and start putting it together for prosecution. And, and now you also need to, to get... Uh, Osuki from Mexico uh, back to the United States. Is, how does that happen? Is, is that something because the warrant is actually an American warrant that's a lot easier? If my memory serves me correctly, the Mexican authorities deported him because he was illegally in Mexico. Okay. And while okay. he was being deported, he was accompanied by uh, FBI. Okay. The so FBI accompanied him from Mexico to Los Angeles. Uh, they, it, it was essentially he was persona non grata in Mexico. That made it very simple. Uh, it was clean. We didn't need any uh, court hearings. We didn't need uh, any writs. We didn't need uh, to get involved in any of the judicial process. They simply kicked him out of the country because he was not authorized to be in Mexico. And FBI LA was kind enough to be his escort. <laughs> Actually, the legat and uh, Jay Fallon brought him into LA, and then we took him from there. But uh, yeah, everybody was quite happy to provide transportation. And actually, uh, Ted Ozuki was quite happy to be back in the United States. I, I guess he was tired of his vacation in Mexico. Oh, especially the last few days. I'm, I'm sure that might have been no doubt kind of, kind of tough <laughs> in a Mexican jail. So now is your part, other than, of course, the, the, the trial and all of that, but as far as the investigation, is your part done at that time? Well, we're just pulling together all the details and making sure all of uh, our paperwork is in line since we've got so much evidence out here and it, uh, or, or have acquired so much evidence. Uh, all the chain of custodies, all the, all the documents, all the paperwork, has to get put together in a way that the Suffolk County, uh, Massachusetts prosecutor can now run with this case. Normally, the fugitive investigators are, unless there's been a, a spontaneous admission after the arrest, the fugitive investigators are pretty much out of the action. But since we had acquired uh, so much in the way of evidence out here, or through our efforts, we stayed on board right up through the guilty verdict. 
So we were involved with the case prep in Boston with the, the DA and sat with the DA during the uh, the trial and testified. Uh, we all had to testify because we were all part of the acquisition of evidence in the chain of custody. So what was the result of that trial? Ozuki was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison, from which he's already tried to escape once. At the end of the trial, for me, the most gratifying thing was to have Roy Sergi's family come to me and, and thank me and, and thank my partner, Dan Foley, for what we had done to not only capture or help capture Ted Ozuki, but help convict him. Uh, you know, kill cops. That's uh, just unacceptable. I'm third generation in law enforcement. My family now has a fourth generation in law enforcement. From the time I was a little kid, you know, it, it was drummed into me that, you know, the whole law enforcement community pulls together when a cop gets killed. And you, know, you pull out all the stops. Nothing else matters. You have to, there has to be closure on this. And that's the way every one of us that worked on this case felt the same way, whether it was you know Jack Carroll, Jimmy Fong, Jimmy Powers, who knew Roy Sergi, or Jay Fallon from the Boston FBI, Dan Foley from SFPD, myself. Uh, we all felt the same way. We were all of one mind. And it, it, so it didn't make any difference if it was, you know, if you just had three Excedrin and it was 18 hours of talking to somebody and your head was splitting. You just went on with it because this was important. Uh, way more important than solving a bank robbery. Did you ever have a chance to repair your relationship with the marshals? Uh, only with several of the inspectors that I had worked with when I was a deputy in L.A. Uh, and it was at a, as a result of Ruby Ridge. The, uh, the Ruby Ridge incident began with uh, a clash between deputy U.S. marshals and the combatants, the right-wingers that were at Ruby Ridge. Uh, during that clash, a deputy that I had worked with was killed. He's the forgotten man of Ruby Ridge, Billy Deegan. As soon as Billy was killed, the guys from upstairs in the marshal's office that I knew came and told me what had transpired. And, uh, yeah, you know, we maintained a good relationship, but only with guys that you know, I'd been in stuff with, you know, guys that I'd worked on, the uh, the Christopher Boyce case with, uh, so we had some history. The uh, people who knew you, who knew, who knew me, who you were, yeah. Yes, we'd gone through the door together, so it it transcended the the, the petty jealousies of agency to agency. And then the last question that I have, you mentioned when we were uh, talking about the FBI files. So this case was profiled on that show. Yes. Well, I will make sure that I include a link to that show in this episode's show notes. So if anybody wants to take a look at that TV show, they can do that too. That would be great. I, I'm sure that was one of the most rewarding cases that you've had, but in your role as a SWAT coordinator and uh, on the Violent Crime Task Force. I know you've worked on a number of high-profile cases. In your time at San Francisco, you did work on the Unabomber case. You worked on the Polly Class kidnapping case. You worked on the Christopher Boyce uh, espionage case. Actually, I worked on Christopher Boyce when I was a deputy. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, we had the ticket on his escape. He escaped from Lompoc when I was a deputy U.S. Marshal in Los Angeles. So you've done a lot, a lot of really, as I would say, you know, kind of macho stuff in the FBI. And, and, I, and that's how I remember you, to tell you the truth, from FBI Academy. You know, it's 20 weeks now, but we were there for 16 weeks of training. And you were definitely one of those uh, testosterone uh, dripping macho guys. And Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 have, I have no problem with that description. I'm, I'm probably less so now, but uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I don't know if you remember this, but it was a Hogan's Alley scenario oh. where I was the lead. I was put in the, I don't know if it was the SAC spot or the case agent spot, and uh, we were after either a fugitive or any. Anyway, he um, 
at the end, the guy playing the part of the bad guy uh, took a hostage, and you took him out. <laughs> you, you snipered him. You don't remember this, do you? No, I don't. But I, I'm not surprised. But okay. <laughs> you did a great job. But after we had, an, you know, every time you have a scenario at the Academy afterwards, there's an after-action discussion. Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, women, it was 1982. Women had been in the Bureau for about 10 years. And uh, I remember one guy in the class, it wasn't you, but started arguing with me about decisions about what was done and what wasn't done. And, and he said to me, you don't want to be the one who kicks the door in. And I remember getting so angry and saying, that, then why in the hell did I join the FBI? Mm-hmm. You know, who who are you to make that distinction that I shouldn't be the one, it should be you? Um, it wasn't you. But, no, it uh, wouldn't be me. No. I worked with too many women as deputies <laughs> that, you know, would, would chew on rebar and spit nails. Uh, yeah. I, I, I had no illusions about women's abilities. We had fun. There, there were certainly frustrations being in the FBI, no doubt about it. But I suspect that you had fun doing it. Uh, that's uh, why I'm still doing. That's why I'm exactly. still doing this stuff. Exactly. I'm very so, proud of my uh, days. Yes, and you should be. You wouldn't have been there at that academy unless you had what it took, and you wouldn't have had a career, and you wouldn't be retired now if you weren't good at what you did. You would have fallen by the wayside uh, for sure. And it, it's more than just I had these qualifications on paper. You have to have something inside you that uh, allows you to push through. Those days that aren't good, those supervisors who are idiots, uh, those hours that seem like are never going to end, or the frustrations of of not accomplishing what you want to accomplish just because you're goal-oriented. This is something that our nation needs, and we do it the best. I love the fact that everybody hates the FBI on the left and the right, and I always clung to that, you know. The FBI is hated by everybody. That that means we're doing the right thing. We're not taking sides here. We're out there putting them all in prison. So we've been good at that. So you're, you're justifiably proud of that and should be. When did you retire? In 2000. What did you do after that? Well, I got a PI license because I would be able to uh, do as much work as I wanted to, and that would fit in well with being Mr. Mom. I've been doing PI work and security work uh, when and where I want. A lot of it contract work for PI companies, most of them FBI agents. We had a group that did quite a bit of post-9-11 security reviews for government and quasi-government entities because there was so much requirement for top-to-bottom security reviews and plans, and nobody had in-house resources. So... We did everything from little park districts to the Port of Richmond, which is one of the largest seaports on the West Coast. Uh, So you were saying you were doing this part-time investigative work because you mentioned something about being Mr. Mom. And I have to tell you (laughs) that when it comes to the label of Mr. Mom, you would have been the person that I would have voted least likely to wear that that label. So tell us more about that. It's funny. uh, I got married late in life, so uh, and had kids late in life. So as I started to approach the ability to retire, I had kids that were in need of supervision after school. And this juggling back and forth and after school programs and things like that. And my wife has a career. She's a hospital executive. And and I had a career. And we were both interested in, uh, in finding an alternative to after school programs. And also, uh, both of us grew up with a parent at home. So we began looking at those possibilities, and I I looked at the finances of my retiring uh, at that point and her continuing to work because she couldn't retire. She's younger than I am. And frankly, she didn't want to retire. (laughs) She had more she wanted to accomplish. So uh, the financials looked like they were doable. Uh, It might be a stretch. We might have to be a little more frugal, but it looked like it was doable. And the kids would have the benefit of a stay-at-home parent, although it wouldn't be mom, it would be dad. And then I had to figure out if I was uh, up for that. And uh, to be honest with you, I felt that I was up for it. There were some folks that questioned that, but I I love my kids, and 
I, I saw it as a unique opportunity to spend time with my kids that most dads will never have. And Especially dads that uh, had been on the SWAT team and hunting down yeah. fugitives and, <laughs> you know, working on kidnapping. So Well, it's is- funny. Uh, early on in my retired Mr. Dad career, I was at a local kid's playground with my kids. And there were a couple of boys there uh, playing about my kid's age. And there was another dad there. You know, it's another, another Mr. Mom, right? And we're kind of looking at each other. And we both had the look. And, you know, so we finally communicated with each other. Uh, he was a retired police lieutenant who had retired to be Mr. Mr. Mom. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was a retired FBI supervisor who retired to be Mr. Mom. Well, it sounds like you had a fabulous FBI career, and then you had a fabulous Mr. Mom career. Oh, it was great. The only thing I missed about the FBI, besides being in the know, was the people. Every day you go into an office and you deal with high-quality people, high-character people. And that's the end of the interview. As always, back at jerrywilliams.com, you'll find photos of Phil, links to newspaper articles about this top 10 case, and a memorial service for fallen Boston police officer Roy Sergi. And there's also a link to that FBI Files TV show about this case, as well as frequently asked questions about the FBI Top 10 program. If you enjoyed the episode, I hope you share it with your friends, family, and associates. I make it easy for you at the bottom of this episode's show notes. You'll find the social media share buttons. I have a great crime fiction recommendation for you this week. The book is Finnegan's Week by Joseph Wamba. Now, for those of you who don't know, Joseph Wamba is considered the father of the police procedural, which is what I like to read, what I like to watch, and what I like to write. Joseph Wamba has a famous saying that I follow as I write my novels. A good crime story is not about how cops work on cases, but how cases work work on cops. In Finnegan's Week, Joseph Wamba introduces us to Finn Finnegan. He's a San Diego police detective and a wannabe actor heading straight for midlife meltdown. The case he's investigating is all about a routine truck theft that turns into a toxic chemical spill, setting off a bizarre chain reaction of death and murder on both sides of the Mexican border. There's a little bit of a love triangle when Finn is forced to team up with Nell Salter, a sexy female investigator, as well as an equally attractive U.S. Navy investigator who wants to learn all that Finn can teach her. I love this book. I really recommend it. If you like crime fiction, if you like police procedurals, you'll really enjoy Finnegan's Week. And while you're at Amazon.com picking up a copy of Joe Wamba's book, I hope you also check out my FBI police procedural, Pay to Play. This episode was sponsored by FBIRetired.com, the only online directory made available to the general public featuring retired FBI agents and analysts interested in showcasing their skills to secure business opportunities. I want to thank you for listening, and I hope you come back again for another episode of FBI Retired Case File Review with Jerry Williams. Thank you.